Welcome back class, I hope you guys are doing well. Uh, today's lecture we're going to be continuing on with our study in Mesopotamia. Last time we looked at uh, and specifically the nation or the people group of Sumeria or the Sumerians in southern Mesopotamia. And today we're going to continue on with uh, other civilizations within the Mesopotamian area. And we're going to be looking at uh, the Babylonians a little bit. We'll be looking at uh, the Hittites. Today we'll also look at Babylonians and uh, Hittites and Phoenicians uh, next lecture. So my plan is for this week is to have uh, this lecture here today and then video number two for this week will be uh, for tomorrow and then the third video of the week is going to be a review with the study guide that I have put on Moodle for you. So we'll uh, review uh, for the exam which is coming up here uh, soon so uh, hang tight and we're going to move into the PowerPoint presentation of this video on uh, Mesopotamia, specifically uh, Babylonia and uh, the Hittite Empire. Okay class, one of the things that I wanted to speak to you uh, before we dive into this uh, slide on Mesopotamia part two, uh, where we will be looking at the Babylonians and Hittites today, I did want to uh, just briefly share um, some more detail in regard to the polytheistic religion of uh, Mesopotamia. Polytheism means that there are uh, many, many gods. And um, Mesopotamian culture, that, that was the case. They had a polytheistic belief, which they, um, they believed in almost every kind of god that was there. Uh, they believed in demons um, that were created by the gods. And uh, they would have worshipped these gods every day. They would have been, uh, there would have been little figurines of the gods in their homes and all around uh, the area that they could worship them every day. Um, and each god had a job to do or some sort of um, attribute that they showed uh, for something in their culture, in their life, in their city, in their society, uh, nature, in their uh, agriculture many different uh, gods. Uh, each city would have had their own god also. So the city god would be the one that would look over the city, which again, uh, what we said last time was that the cities were like city-states. Each They would each have their own king and kind of government and temple, ziggurat, or, or whatever. Uh, it was the size of the city, what they had in the city. And the god would be there to protect uh, the city. And um, their, their special god for their city would talk to uh, the gods of other cities, and um, they would uh, they would go to these false gods and um, ask them to intercede for them for uh, relations with the other uh, city states that were around them. Um, but no god was more unique or powerful than uh, than any other. They were just kind of all respected as the same, and it was just a polytheistic uh, nation. The Babylonians and the Assyrians believed um, uh, all of the Sumerian gods. So the Sumerians had their gods. That was one of the earliest civilizations in Mesopotamia. But then the Babylonians and the uh, Assyrians, they also uh, looked at the Sumerian gods as um, true gods. And then they also had their own gods in, in their areas. And... Uh, they did believe that some gods were more powerful than the others, but they looked at all of them kind of as as um, as equal in regards to their their deity. They had gods for um, the sky. They had gods for the sun, the air, the crops. Uh, but the Babylonians had a a main god, and this is this is important. So you might want to jot it down. Uh, the Babylonians had a god called Marduk. M-A-R-D-U-K, and it was the most powerful gods uh, t to them, the god Marduk. And then the Assyrians had a powerful god. Their most powerful god uh, was Ashur, A-S-H-U-R, Ashur, and that was the most powerful god of the Assyrians. The Sumerians and later on the Babylonians and the Assyrians, the Assyrians were in like the northern part of Mesopotamia, uh, all believed that everything good and bad happened to them as a result of the gods' pleasure or displeasure. So that was a main belief that they had to please the gods so that good things would happen to them. So if something bad happened 
to them a natural disaster or an invasion by an enemy or they lost a battle. It was because of uh, the gods uh, being unhappy, and so they had to do things that would make them happy. So I just wanted to uh, share with you the religion of Mesopotamia. It's important to understand this, uh, not just for an exam question, but just to have an understanding of the religious system in these early uh, early civilizations in Mesopotamia. Okay, so we're going to move on into today's lecture and uh, just a real quick recap about the writing. Um, what do we call the earliest Sumerian writing? Uh, basically, what they did was they first attempted to have some kind of writing by using symbols and pictures, and and uh, that it really wasn't a language. It was more of just a way to um, to communicate what they were like, what they wanted in, in, through these pictographs of objects or animals. Uh, but uh, as you see in page on page thirty eight in your book, uh, there was a more advanced. Um, uh, writing or language uh, called cuneiform, which means wedge-shaped, and this is how they wrote um, uh, wrote in clay tablets with a piece, piece of reed. Uh, so uh, cuneiform was actually the is actually the oldest uh, known language because it's a, it's a true language, unlike maybe pictographs. Uh, but um, cuneiform is how they um, began to uh, communicate with one another through this. Uh, early language and it lasted many many uh, years um, now in brief to the text in page 30 just uh, a few little notes on this if you want to go in your book to page 30 and there's a there's a part in the book on page 30 underneath the picture there of the ziggurat uh, called the course of the empire, and uh, if you can read through uh, that short little paragraph in regards to the course of the empire, it's, it begins off with once they had organized effective states, Mesopotamians ventured beyond boundaries of their societies. As early as 2800 BCE, conflicts between city-states often led to war, as aggrieved or ambitious, ambitious kings sought to punish or conquer their neighbors. So you see that the empire was beginning to get become solidified, and and uh, they would um, trade with one another, but they would also go to war against one another. Continuing on, Su uh, Sumerian accounts indicate that the king of Kish, a city-state located just east of Babylon, extended his rule to much of the southern Mesopotamia after 2000 BCE. For example, the Sumerian poems praise King Gilgamesh for later liberating Uruk from Kish's control. In efforts to move beyond constant conflicts, a series of conquerors worked to establish order on a scale larger than the city-state by building empires that supervised the affairs of numerous subject cities and peoples. After 2350 BCE, Mesopotamia fell under the control of several powerful regional empires. So basically, this is uh, just a look at how city-states um, became controlled, numerous city-states became controlled by one larger city-state or powerful city-state or a king and um, began to establish larger territories where numerous city-states were underneath of the authority of a king and so empires began to uh, to grow and you know, pop up and grow and they would fight against one another uh, but just have an understanding of where uh, empires came from. How would you define empire? This is an important question for you. A group of nations, territories, or peoples ruled by a single authority such as a king or emperor. And that's a pretty good definition of what, uh, what an empire is. So make sure you know that. A group of nations, territories, or peoples ruled by a single authority such as a king or emperor. Okay, Mesopotamian empires. We have Akkadian empires. Uh, these empires basically emerged from the S Semitic peoples, um, and they're the Akkadians, uh, Babylonians, and um, right here's a picture of Sargon, Sargon of Akkad, or the Ak Akkadians. He was a creator of an empire in Mesopotamia who was a talented administrator and a uh, brilliant warrior. 
Um, looks like he had a problem there with his eyeball. If you see there on his on the screen of that picture, uh, if that is a accurate representation of Sargon. But he, uh, let me go back to him. Uh, he relied heavily on his uh, personal presence to maintain security in the realm. So he was very active in his empire. He traveled all over the place in his empire. He's known to be ta to take um, armies all around with him. Uh, some of his armies uh, numbered uh, as many as 5,000 soldiers that traveled with him to show his power, to show that he was in control. Um, he placed a heavy burden on the cities that he visited that were under his control because all all of these soldiers show up with him and they need to you know have food and shelter and he put a great uh, burden on these cities. Uh, the people of the cities um, basically resented that they showed up and so there would be rebellions almost everywhere he went uh, because the people didn't want to deal with the army that was there. Um, so basically to seize, uh, to, to support uh, his armies, he would seize uh, the trade routes and the supplies of natural resources. He would just take them to feed his armies and to feed, um, to feed his city uh, where he was from. Um, he uh, would uh, take, in regards to the natural resources, uh, silver, um, tin, so we're looking at some metals, uh, definitely wood. They would need they would need a lot of wood. Cedar uh, was very prevalent there in the time, and so he would have a lot of um, uh, wood, uh, cedar wood taken for what he needed. He w controlled tax and trade, and, um, and became wealthy because he gained almost all the financial resources would go to him. Uh, he transformed his capital, uh, Acad, into uh, the most powerful city. Uh, in the world at that time. And uh, at the high point of his reign, the empire um, basically controlled almost all of Mesopotamia. So he was very powerful. But by 2150 uh, BC, uh, the empire had reached its limit and began to collapse. So Sargon of Akkadia. Okay, another empire, um, the Babylonians, and this is one of the main ones we'll be talking about in this lecture and also in the next lecture, the Babylonians. Uh, first off, we want to talk about Hammurabi. You may have heard this guy's name, Hammurabi. He was king of the Four Quarters. And um, two key features under Hammurabi is that he had a centralized government and a code of laws called Lex Talionis. And uh, you may have heard of that, like Hammurabi's laws. Um, very, very famous uh, law system. Uh, but uh, Hammurabi reigned from 1792 to 1750 BC, and the Babylonian Empire uh, dominated uh, Mesopotamia uh, until 1600 uh, BC. So, in regards to the centralized government, um, he improved on Sargon, remember Sargon of Akkadia, uh, uh, the Akkadian Empire. Um, he improved on Sargon's administrative techniques by relying on a centralized government, a bureaucratic uh, government. He relied on regular taxation to fund what he needed funding. Um, now, he did not travel from city to city like Sargon did, uh, but what he did was he ruled from Babylon, the actual city of Babylon, which is near today's uh, Baghdad, Iraq. And so he actually ruled from his city. And he stationed deputies out into the city-states all around. That's how he controlled the empire, because he had deputies out in the different regions to um, institute the laws, enforce laws, uh, to collect taxes. Um, so it was, it was more efficient that way. He didn't put the great uh, burden on the city-states by bringing an army there like uh, Sargon did. So just these uh, representatives for him in these city-states uh, were able to manage the large empire. Moving on from centralized government, the Code of Laws, or Lex Talionis, um, was, a, was a very famous early law system that, uh, that Hammurabi uh, set up, called the Hammurabi Code. And it's... Um, basically the most extensive law code um, 
of this ancient time. So lex talionis is a Latin phrase, and it means law of retaliation. Basically, the offender suffers punishment resembling the, uh, the violation. So if anyone brings an accusation of any crime before the elders and does not prove what has been charged, he shall, if a capital offense is charged, be put to death. So you can see that there's, a, um, there's serious punishments that can go on in the Hammurabi Code. So this example here on the screen, um, basically if you couldn't prove the charge, um, that became a reason to be put to death. So very serious. It prescribed the death penalty for murder, theft, fraud, false accusations, sheltering runaway slaves, failure to obey royal orders, adultery, incest, all of this you were killed. Civil laws were set up to uh, regulate prices and wages and commercial dealings and marital relationships and slavery conditions and judges uh, many times did not follow the, the standards that uh, promoted uh, some degree of unity for the empire. Sometimes they uh, wanted to um, uh, kind of line their pockets uh, by uh, being bribed. There was corruption in it by the judges, but it was a definitely a detailed law code. So on the screen, there's a couple of uh, other examples here of the code. If a builder builds a house for someone and does not construct it properly and the house he built falls in and kills the owner, then the builder shall be put to death. Another version is that if the, the owner of the house, if their son dies, then the builder's son should be put to death. If a son strikes a father, his hand shall be hewn off or cut off. If a man puts out the eye of a patrician, his eye shall be put out. If a man knocks the teeth out of another man, his own teeth will be knocked out. So basically, if you commit a crime, you have the... If you commit a crime, you have the exact same thing uh, done to you. So uh, definitely something to pay attention uh, to and, um, and understand the Hammurabi Code or the Hammurabi Laws in Babylon. The next empire we're going to look at is the Hittite Empire. So that was the Babylonians, uh, which we will talk about the Babylonians a little bit more later. Uh, the Hittite Empire is in Mesopotamia, and on page 32 in your book, there's a map of uh, of the uh, Mesopotamia, uh, uh, the Hittite, excuse me, the Hittite Empire. On uh, page 32 on the map, it's uh, like the north area is shaded in purple. And you can see there's like a hatch mark area also that they uh, there was some war going on and they were able to conquer uh, conquer that area uh, also. Okay, there's uh, the text pages if you want to look at that. Uh, some of the most influential uh, Indo-European migrants uh, in the in the early times because of its location uh, that trade routes would r run through there. Um, Approximately 1900 BC, the Hittites migrated to the central plain of Anatolia and imposed their language and rule on the region's inhabitants. And they built powerful kingdoms, especially by the 17th and 16th century BC. Uh, powerful kingdoms, and they had close relationships with other Mesopotamian uh, people groups. They traded with the Babylonians. They traded with the Assyrians. They adapted cuneiform as their writing. And uh, they embraced many of the Mesopotamian um, deities into their own religion, which had many gods itself. So it was just a, another look at a collection of gods. And they dominated for, um, for about 250 years. They were in, uh, in power. The other areas were still around, but this, the other empires were still around. But the Hittites dominated this northern area of Mesopotamia. So two things you need to know. The Hittites were responsible for two technologies, two technological innovations. The, the construction of, of light horse-drawn um, chariots and refined iron tools and weapons because of their metallurgy. Uh, and that greatly strengthened their empire. So let's look at these real quick. Forged iron tools and weapons. 
Um, after 1300 BC, the Hittites refined the technology of iron metallurgy, which enabled them to produce effective weapons, a lot of weapons, very cheap. And the Hittites craftsmen discovered that if they heat the iron in charcoal and um, and then pounded it and made it into the weapon, they heated it and pounded it um, in the charcoal, that it became very durable and they, it could uh, make very strong uh, weapons for war. Uh, the next thing, or the second thing that they were um, uh, given in regards to uh, the technological innovation is uh, chariot warfare. Uh, they developed this new, the new spoked wheel, so it wasn't a solid wheel anymore, but a spoked wheel that made the chariots much lighter and maneuverable uh, c compared to uh, the Sumerian solid wheel. And it helped to um, establish campaigns, military campaigns, in Anatolia. And the chair chariot warfare was effective, and, and the technique kind of spread around, and they became kind of like the, the elite force. And actually, chariot warfare for m many centuries was like the elite force of the military um, from, from Rome all the way to, to China. I mean, it lasted a long time. The chariots were like the tanks uh, of, the, of the military back then. So uh, the more chariots uh, a military commander had, the more powerful they were. So the Hittites, um, they were not the original inventors of, of the horse-drawn chariot uh, or of iron metallurgy. In both cases, they built on, on previous um, precedents that the Mesopotamians had worked on, but they became so adapted to this and so... Um, well innovated in uh, forged iron tools and weapons and chariot warfare that um, other people groups started to adopt what the Hittites uh, were doing. So they weren't the inventors of metallurgy or weren't the inventors of a horse-drawn uh, chariot, uh, but they were the ones that just improved it to the point of becoming a great powerful empire uh, because of it. So they were like the innovators of uh, of these two uh, two things, they use these technology to displace the Babylonians. Okay, so we're going to move now on to the broader influence of the Mesopotamian uh, empire uh, society, uh, the different areas, uh, different empires throughout Mesopotamia. And uh, while building cities and regional states, Mesopotamians deeply influenced the development and experiences of people uh, beyond Mesopotamia as people spread out. Um, often wealth and power would attract people to Mesopotamia. Uh, they projected their power to foreign lands and they would impose force on them. Uh, if they needed to. Other peoples adopted Mesopotamian ways and adapted them as they needed uh, for their own interests. So uh, Mesopotamia had a broader influence on other surrounding areas. Migration and, um, and settlements. Again, people moved around, people moved through, there were migration routes and there were trade routes and settlements were spreading out and uh, religious leaders would uh, collect oral reports and um, began putting together writings of uh, the different religion, belie religious beliefs with the different polytheistic gods. Uh, page 41 to 42, the Assyrian and Babylonian conquests. Uh, the Israelites placed uh, increasing emphasis on the God uh, Yahweh, the true God of the Bible. In 722 BC, Assyrian forces conquered the northern kingdom and deported the Israelites into other communities, and they lost their identity. So uh, even though this is not an Old Testament survey course, um, the nation of Israel, uh, they had a civil war, and they split, and there was the northern kingdom and southern kingdom. Well, the northern kingdom was taken away uh, under the, uh, the Assyrians. The Assyrians captured, took them into captivity and exiled them, and they never returned. 
uh, the southern kingdom, which was Judah, they were taken into uh, captivity by the Babylonians, the Babylonian exile. Now, they did return and uh, were able to rebuild uh, some of the city, like Nehemiah um, in, in the Bible. But uh, Jerusalem was destroyed in 586 B.C. And uh, between the 9th and the 6th centuries, a series of prophets urged Israel to rededicate themselves to their faith and obedience to Yahweh's command. And uh, then that brings us up to the intertestamental period, the 400 years of silence uh, in the Bible. Um, so that we just had a real, just in those few sentences, a real uh, brief look at many, many centuries of history. And we'll be getting more into the Babylonian uh, Empire uh, in the next lecture. Okay, so. okay, class, that's, that's good for today, for today's lecture. Uh, I hope you guys are uh, in the reading, in the book, immersing yourself in the book so you can uh, have a full understanding of these different empires, uh, more than just these lecture notes or these PowerPoints, uh, but really digging into the book to understand what these empires are about. Uh, as you can see the screen behind me here, uh, we are uh, immersed in the Babylonian uh, ruins. These are archaeological digs, and uh, these are um, parts of ancient Babylon. So uh, just a fun little uh, thing there. Uh, that um, I can do here with the computer. Uh, so anyway, thanks for uh, uh, being here for this class session, and uh, we will see you in the next video.